The next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to study this portion of the Word of God today. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. So now we're up to Matthew chapter 2, verse 16. When Herod saw that he had been duped by the wise men, he became outraged. And Herod, later in his life, uh, really became power mad and a bit bitter about things. And, well, he just went nuts. When, when those uh, wise men got through his security, he was, well, it, he personally was offended by that because he had thought he was uh, going to dupe these people into coming back and disclosing the location of our Lord. But they didn't. They went another way and somehow slipped through uh, Herod's great security system, and Herod became enraged. He sent men, this is how enraged he became, he sent men to kill all the children in the area of Bethlehem, age two and under, according to the time he had learned from the wise men. And that's because he wanted to make sure that if there was any young male, that that young male would be destroyed. So he took about the time when the star had appeared as being the point of uh, the birth of Christ. And then he uh, gave himself a two-year leeway to make sure he would be killed along with all the other uh, males. And that was according to the time that he had learned from the wise men. Then what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah was fulfilled. Verse 18, a voice was heard in Ramah. And Ramah is a small town on a hill between Jerusalem and Bethlehem, which means he didn't just uh, kill the young people in, the, in Bethlehem itself. He even went to the outlying areas and killed some of the uh, children living in the rural areas, such as this uh, small town that is located on a hill between Jerusalem and Bethlehem. Weeping and loud wailing... Rachel, and the reason it says Rachel is because Rachel was one of Jacob's wives, and therefore this is an idiom. It's an idiom for all of the children of the uh, Jewish uh, mothers. So all the mothers were weeping and wailing, so prophecy was fulfilled. Ra Rachel weeping for her children, the Jewish mothers weeping for their children, and she did not want to be comforted because they were gone. So a tremendous amount of suffering was incurred on these innocent people. And this shows the viciousness of King Herod. And King Herod was very vicious. But today he's burning in hell. And even his death was vicious. And the, uh, the, the description of his death is uh, pretty... He became to stink so terribly. Nobody wanted to be around him while he was alive. Just a ter tremendous stench. And then nobody could really tend to him, and he pretty much rotted to death as part of uh, his punishment for uh, being such an evil person. And now, of course, he's in hell. After Herod died, and Herod died in about uh, 4 B.C. So we see that the birth of Christ actually was in 4 B.C., and this is because some of the uh, people who kept calendars in the Middle Ages uh, they got, well, it's about four years off. So even though we have before Christ and after Christ, uh, the actual calendar is about four years off. So it's about 4 B.C. that our Lord was born. And the scholars say, well, you see, that was the same time when the two planets are aligned to make the brightest star. Well, maybe that's true. And so after Herod died, an angel of the Lord, of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, get up. Take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel. For those who were seeking the child's life 
are dead. Those refers to Harold or Herod, not even uh, not just Herod, but also his sons Alexander, Aristobulus, and Antipeter, and they all wanted Jesus dead. His sons were just as vicious as he were as he was, yet they were a bit uh, stupider. The Herod was pretty smart in his construction of everything related to Jerusalem, including the temple. And if you have a, a Bible that has pictures of some of these things, it is phenomenal, all the construction that went on in Jerusalem at that time. So uh, they were dead. Those who were seeking the child's life are dead. And those refers to uh, not only Herod, but also some of the others who wanted Christ dead. So he got up and took the child and his mother and returned to the land of Israel. So Joseph, uh, Joseph heard this and just got up and obeyed the command and went straight back to Israel. No questions asked. And even though he was probably well settled in Egypt by now, and no questions asked, just do what the Lord says. And this shows, again, part of Joseph's nobility, his grace orientation, and his ability to move when God says move. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of his father, Herod, he was afraid to go there because he was a very cruel man just as his father was. So after being warned in a dream, he went north to the region of Galilee. So Joseph uh, settled in Galilee because there's a different ruler in Gal Galilee. And this would be Archelaus' younger brother. And this would be Herod, Phil uh, Herod Philip. And Herod Philip was a benevolent despot. It is possible to have a dictator who is benevol bene benevolent. Now, uh, like Saddam Hussein, he wasn't benevolent. But Iraq could have had another dictator who would have been benevolent. And some people might uh, say, well, why does the United States support this guy? He's a dictator. Well, in some cases, we're wrong. But in some cases, they are benevolent dictators, and there's nothing wrong with that whatsoever. Because uh, uh, we're shoving democracy everywhere, but democracy isn't really the highest form of government. Remember, uh, the monarch will be the highest form of government when Jesus is the king. Then, of course, it's the greatest form of government. Uh, that is when uh, the person in charge in a monarch is a good leader. Then, of course, things get done rapidly and a lot of changes occur. In our system, it grinds very slowly when things want to get done. But that's a blessing in disguise nowadays because the way people think, uh, we would have already been in communism if people could do it as quickly as they want to. So we do have the Constitution and things like that, uh, keeping some things from happening, yet we still are losing a lot of freedom. So he was a benevolent despot who was carrying on the building that was started by his father in the Galilean area. And he knew, and that is Joseph knew, he could work there at, because he was a construction contractor. He wasn't just a, a little a nobody a type of person who did construction as a part of a job. He was actually a contractor. And our Lord Jesus Christ, who worked with his father, well, that was a highly regarded uh, profession in those days. Today it's not as highly regarded, but back then it was. Because there was so much construction going on, there was a high demand for people with those skills. And they made a lot of money. And there was probably a more demand for them than for doctors because medicine back then hadn't advanced far anyway. So they, uh, it, it wasn't, everybody thinks Jesus was a carpenter as a lowly position. It was not a lowly position in those days. It was a highly regarded position. And that is what uh, Joseph worked in, and that is what Jesus would also work in. Because in the family, if the father did something, usually the son would follow suit and carry on the family business. That's the way it worked in those days. <clears throat> so he went to Galilee because it would be more favorable. Then in 23, he came to a town called Nazareth. Now, Nazareth, of course, we have the Nazarenes, and this is a very small village in Galilee. It's north of Samaria and Judea. It's located about 15 miles west of the southern edge of the Sea of Galilee. So it's 15 miles west of the Sea of Galilee, and we hear about our Lord, and we'll see our Lord later, going to the Sea of Galilee uh, quite often. 
So they moved to Nazareth and lived there. Then what had been spoken by the prophet Isaiah was fulfilled, that he would be called a Nazarene. Now, he would be called a Nazarene, but he was not of the line of the Nazarenes. So when you see a picture of Jesus with long hair, while the Nazarenes had long hair, Jesus did not. Because in 1 Corinthians, of course, uh, long hair on men is prohibited. And, uh, well, there's a reason for that, and we'll study that in 1 Corinthians. But for Jesus, he did not have long hair. Now, in the days, they probably didn't have as many barber shops as we do today. We don't know the exact length of Jesus' hair. In fact, we do not know how Jesus looked at all. All of them are artist renditions. But I can guarantee you, it wasn't hair down his back. It may have been a little shaggy, I'm not sure. But it wasn't hair down his back, for sure. And just because he was a Nazarene, people will always say, he was a Nazarene, so he had to have long hair because that was their custom. And it was their custom because they had a specialized thing that they had to do in the land, showing submission to God. Long hair always shows submission. That's found in 1 Corinthians, and that's why the women are to have longer hair than their husband. It's not specified the length, but it has been concluded that as long as the hair of the woman is longer than the hair of the husband, <laughs> then that shows submission, and that is the rule. Now, that doesn't mean if you get cancer and you have to go through chemo and lose all your hair, you're doing something wrong. No. But if you have the hair, then as long as it's longer than your husband's hair, then you're fine. But if it's the other way around, well, then there's a problem. All of that's related to 1 Corinthians. So we'll just clear that up right now. Jesus did not have very long, pretty hair. He, well, we don't know if he had a crew cut, but he definitely did not have long hair. Now we move on to chapter 3. Now there's a 30-year lapse between chapters 2 and chapters 3. 30 years. And so in chapter 3, we begin with the herald of the king. And this is the angelic heralds, which uh, uh, heralded the first advent of the king in Luke chapter 2, 1 through 15. The second advent, advent of the angelic herald is the mighty angel in Revelation chapter 10. And the human heralds of the second advent are the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11. And that will be Moses and Elijah coming back in the tribulation in which they will blow fire out of their mouth and kill a lot of people. That's something that's uh, phenomenal. But the herald of the king. In those days, in about 29 A.D., John the baptizer. Now, you might have John the Baptist. John was not a Baptist, but he was a baptizer. John the baptizer. And John was descended from Aaron, which means he was from the, li the tribe of Levi. Remember, the tribe of Levi is the priestly tribe. So as such, John was a true priest. So in those days, John the baptizer, John being a true priest, and he baptized uh, people uh, on the basis of they had already believed in Christ, so their baptism was a ritual that signified their faith in Christ. And that's what baptism was used for. And he came into the desert of Judea. Now he went to the uh, desert of Judea and people came there. They went out in the middle of a desert to hear a man preach. So that means God will provide the hearers every time. If a man has a message of doctrine and people want to hear it, they'll go anywhere to get it even out into a desert. And he went out into the desert for several reasons. One of the main reasons was to get away from the religious crowds. The religious crowds filled all the large cities in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and they were all very religious. And John the baptizer wanted to separate himself from religion. He was showing a separation from religion by being in a desert. And those who believed in Christ went out to listen to him. Some were saved and then some were baptized. And this is a phenomenal thing. Uh, just remember he's in a desert. So uh, thinking that one day we might need a big building or something. Well, if it comes to pass, great. But uh, really, uh, people will show up anywhere to get the word of God. Even if we had to stand out in heat and humidity, if they thought it were important, they would be there because they stood out in the heat 
with John the baptizer. So he came into the uh, desert of Judea, continually proclaiming. Remember, repentance is meta noieo. It means to have a change of mind. And in the Old English, it used the word repentance. And during the time of Shakespeare, repentance means that, to change your mind. It had no emotional connotation involved with it whatsoever. So Shakespeare would say something like, it is the prerogative of the woman of repentance. Well, you know what that means. It's the prerogative of the woman to change her mind, as the woman often does. And that's not a bad thing, or the women changing their mind all the time. Sometimes it shows a flexibility, a flexibility to change when you get all the facts. And even in the Bible it says God changed his mind. He never really did, but it was so that we can understand through anthropopathism God's policy. So repentance here has to deal with changing their mind. And what he said was, change your mind about Christ. Right now you don't believe in Christ, but change your mind about Christ. And, of course, we have metanoieo in the Greek, which means a change your mind. And here it is a transitive verb, which means it has a subject and an object, which means that you must change your mind. In regard to salvation, the subject is the unbeliever, and the object is always Christ. So the subject unbeliever must change their mind about object Christ. And that is why metanoieo is used. For the kingdom of heaven is near. And this had to do with the fact that, uh, well, the millennium would have been near if they had accepted Christ, but they didn't. So the millennium has been put off uh, because they did not believe in Jesus Christ. And then in verse 3, for he is the one who was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one proclaiming dogmatically in the desert. This is the corrected translation. The voice of one proclaiming dogmatically in the desert. So John the baptizer was no mealy mouth. He was dogmatic when it came to scripture and when it came to salvation by faith alone in Christ alone. Very dogmatic, just as our Lord would be dogmatic. What's that mean? It means he spoke with authority, just as our Lord did, unlike all of the religious people who said, well, it could mean this, but it could mean that. No, he said, this is what it means. This is scripture, the word of God, and he did it dogmatically so that people would listen. Now, people don't listen to wishy-washy people. Now, they might listen so that their toes don't get stepped on because uh, people don't like to uh, hear, be, uh, be reproved and corrected. As scripture says, there must be reproof and correction. And we all need reproof and correction in life, and people don't like that. But you have to be dogmatic, just as John the baptizer was dogmatic. Now the voice here, the word voice, emphasizes the content of the message, which phases out personality. When it says the voice, no mention of how the guy looked, no mention of uh, even the tone of his voice, except that it was dogmatic. Well, it's excluding personality, and what it's saying by using the word voice instead of the man, you see, it could have said uh, the, the man of the one proclaiming, but it didn't. It said the voice. So it emphasizes a point that it's the message, not the man. It never is the man. It's always the message. Is the message accurate? It doesn't really matter what the personality is. Some uh, pastors have very boring personalities, but they still have the gift, and it's the message anyway. And if you've ever heard a Lewis Sperry Schaefer, I, I, uh, Gary had a tape of him one time, and I believe he gave us one, and we listened to him. His voice is very groggy, and he speaks very slowly, but when you listen to it, you know it's the Word of God. And the message is a very clear and concise, even though at that time in his life, I guess he was older, and his voice was very, very scratchy. And sometimes you'd have to rewind and say, what did he just say? But it was still a message that people heard, president of De Dallas Theological Seminary. So a voice must have a brain, and therefore you have to have uh, the person teaching the Word of God must know something about doctrine in order to teach it, and so that they won't be uh, flopping back and forth when it comes to Scripture. Then he says, prepare for salvation the way of the Lord. 
prepare for salvation, the way of the Lord. This is the aorist tense in the Greek. And this means that it is at a point of time when someone believes in Jesus Christ. And remember, we can break life down into three phases. Phase one, believe in Jesus Christ. Phase two, live your spiritual life. And phase three is, of course, when you depart and go to be with the Lord. So those are the three phases of life. And here it's dealing with phase one. Prepare uh, you, the way of the Lord. That means salvation. People were being saved and he was there giving the gospel to prepare the way for salvation. Preparing the way of the Lord. Simply means giving the gospel and at a point in time people believed in Christ. Make his paths straight. And this has to do with phase two. And in this case it's referring to the rebound technique. So what was occurring was uh, the John the baptizer was preaching the gospel and people would believe and he was also teaching people to rebound and they would rebound. He was teaching them the two most basic doctrines preparing the way for the Lord. And that is what uh, every pastor uh, should uh, teach right off. First of all salvation, secondly rebound. The two most important things, the first being, of course, to be saved, and the second in your experiential spiritual life, to know rebound so that you can, uh, in our case, continue to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. In verse 4, chapter 3, verse 4, Now John's clothing was made from camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then, we have the word then in verse 5. This means after John had did what God wanted him to do. And what God wanted him to do was to be in a desert because the desert uh, only doesn't have, it doesn't have people. There's no people in a desert because people live near where there's water. There were no people there. So that was one point so that people would go there from positive volition. Secondly, no religion in a desert. And John the baptizer liked that idea to be separated from the religion which was rampant in those days. Then people kept going out face to face with him from Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan. So what this is saying is that, look, John the baptizer was in a desert, but he had a message and people who were positive found him. Just as if uh, people around here aren't saved and want the gospel, they will walk in here. And if people want the word of God, they will walk in here. The fact that we don't have a 5,000 member church means that you know, people don't want it. That's what it means. Because they even found John the baptizer in a desert. And we're talking about a country that's about to go under the fifth cycle of discipline. So how close are we? Probably moving in that direction, although I don't want to scare anybody, but we are moving that way unless there is a turnaround and people have a change of mind about Christ and a change of mind about the Word of God. So they came out to meet him in a desert and they were baptized. Of course, that had to do with the identification with the person of Christ through the ritual and he only performed the ritual after someone had believed. And he would make the people declare, well, if he was going to baptize them, what he would do is uh, say, have you believed in Christ? And they would say yes. Then he would baptize them because he believed in a ritual with reality. He just didn't ad homily uh, baptize everyone who walked into the water. There was a stipulation. Have you believed in Christ? Just as with communion, have you believed in Christ? And if you have, that is the only stipulation for you to take it. Now, just for you to know, when we do communion, you must also be in fellowship because if you take communion out of fellowship, you'll be punished. So you must be in fellowship as well. As well. So uh, just as communion, which is a ritual, so in this ritual of baptism, he made sure that at first they were saved. And they were baptized by him in the Jordan River and kept on acknowledging their sins. Now, this doesn't mean they were acknowledging their sins for salvation. Remember, when you're baptized, you're already saved. And in this case, when they were baptized, they had already believed in Christ. The fact that they kept on acknowledging their post-salvation sins means they were living their spiritual life. And John the baptizer was teaching them rebound. And they knew how to do it, and they did it. So that's what it means. It doesn't mean they went to the river and named their sins and then were baptized. No, they were baptized 
Then they kept on, this is the way it's given in the Greek, kept on acknowledging their sin. So every time they sinned, and they did, they named them to God, their post-salvation sins. Now on to verse 7 of chapter 3. But when he saw many Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be baptized. Well, what happened is John the baptizer looked out and he recognized the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he, they're easy to spot because usually they have a holy look on their face. And it's really, to me, it's holy crap. But they come in looking with their uh, pious look. And they have their special language that they use. So he picked up on that right away. And usually a special code of dress, a holy type of uh, dress, in which uh, they try to appear to man to be holy. So he immediately spotted the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to be baptized. Now, the Pharisees were members of one of the most important and influential religious and political parties of Judaism at that time. And religion oftentimes likes to associate itself with politics. And even in Christianity today, in our country, Christians are trying to have impact through politics. When your impact is invisible, don't go around trying to change legislation. Don't go around trying to shut down the uh, nudie bars. Well, this is the devil, devil's world. We're going to have things like that. And don't go around trying to shut down the liquor store because people have alcohol problems. And don't go around uh, trying to enforce your will on other people through legislation. But that's what they did as being part of the, uh, well, the Pharisees. They were part of a political party, uh, a religious political party. And then we have the Sadducees. Now the Pharisees and the Sadducees always nitpicked each other. They were actually adversaries, yet they were both very religious. And so they were a separate political party. And they and the Sadducees uh, on certain doctrines would uh, differ from the Pharisees. Just like we have congregations today or uh, in which you have Methodists and Baptists and Catholics. And all of them, them seem to differ on, on certain doctrinal points. But most of them are wholly religious, completely religious, holy as in W-H, but completely and totally religious and uh, many of them not even saved. The Pharisees were strict and zealous adherents to the Old Testament laws, as well as their numerous additions to it, which means the Pharisees were uh, deep into tabooism. And they had certain taboos that weren't even listed in the Mosaic Law that they created because of their own religious ideas. The Sadducees were Hellenized, meaning uh, they uh, were more of the rational political party. And that's because uh, being Hellen Hellenized, well, the Greeks like to be uh, rationalistic. And they were usually aristocrats, the wealthier uh, of them, not, and the Pharisees weren't as wealthy. And they controlled the official political structures of Judaism at this time because they were the majority of the members of the Sanhedrin. So they were the majority, so they were the ruling party. That would be the Sadducees. But though both the Pharisees and the Sadducees were very religious, and they came to be baptized. Some of them came out of curiosity to see what was being said. Others of them came to, well, uh, uh, nit nitpick at everything John the bap Baptizer had to say. So uh, John the Baptist being, Baptizer, sorry, it's just a habit. John the Baptizer... Uh, being very dogmatic, uh, looked at those people and said this, you generation of vipers. Now imagine you just walk into a church and somebody stands up and looks at you in your manner of dress and knows you're very religious and looks at you and stares you in the eye and says, you generation of vipers. Well, you would be highly offended unless you had some humility about you. So John the baptizer didn't compromise when it came to Scripture. He uh, said, first time you ever saw him, you generation of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? That is the baptism of fire. Who, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? In other words, who warned you about hell fire? Why are you here, you who are going to hell? Very tough. Therefore, 
Then we have uh, what from the Greek it actually means produce the result. This means that before I baptize you, you must give a verbal announcement to me that you have believed in Christ. And that's what he said. Therefore, before I baptize you, produce the result. That proves your change of mind. That proves your change of mind about Christ. And don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. And what, the, what they thought is that salvation came genetically. They would be in Abraham's bosom, which would be uh, paradise, simply because they were born uh, from the lineage of Abraham. And so he says, do not say to yourselves, as they often did, we have Abraham as, I, as our father. For I tell you that God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Now, he could have, but he didn't because that would have been outside of the angelic conflict. Uh, human beings needed to believe in Christ, although very well God could raise up stones and call them children of Abraham and take them to heaven. It is a possibility, but it's not going to happen because, uh, well, there's an angelic conflict and it would be of no value in the courtroom to do so. But what John the baptizer is telling them is, look, you're not saved because you were uh, born under Abraham. You're saved by a change of mind about Christ. Believe in Christ. That's the way of your salvation. And if you think you're saved because of your uh, lineage, because of your birth, and because of who and what you are, God can turn stones into Abraham's children. So he was being very, very tough with these uh, Pharisees and Sadducees who walked up to a uh, seat to be baptized. Even now, the axe, he's still being tough, and the axe refers to divine discipline. Even now, the axe is laid at the root of the trees. This is talking about divine discipline. And every tree that does not produce intrinsically good fruit, this has to do with the experiential spiritual life. You see, these religious people thought they were producing good fruit by their good works, by their good deeds. So he tells them, unless you're producing intrinsically good fruit, that is divine production, you will be cut down and thrown into fire. That just means you're identified with fire. Indeed, I identify you, this is in the kingdom of heaven, with water because of your change of mind, that is about Christ. Indeed, I, I identify you with water because of your change of mind with Christ. And in fact, this was the first time in history that uh, people were being baptized. It, uh, we have the baptism of Moses, but remember, not one of those children of Israel got wet in the baptism of Moses. They walked through on dry land. The baptism of Moses means identification with Moses. They all identified Moses as the leader when they walked on dry land through the sea. And so that is what baptism means. And I told a Catholic person that one time because they said, I have to be baptized to be saved, and they do the sprinkling on of water. And I said, well, which baptism? The baptism of Moses? Well, what do you mean? I said, the baptism of Moses in the Bible. And then they got offended, of course, because they couldn't... Uh, uh, well, they just didn't know Scripture, as all, most people don't. Even now, the axe, divine discipline, is laid at the root of the trees, and every tree does, that does not produce intrinsically good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire, that is, to be identified with fire. Indeed, I identify you with the, in the kingdom of heaven with water because of your change of mind about Christ. But he who is coming after me is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to lay. He's talking about the Savior, Jesus Christ. He will identify you with the Holy Spirit. That is, at the moment of salvation, we are identified with the Holy Spirit. That's why when it says, believe and be baptized, well, it actually, believe and as a result, you are baptized. Apart from yourself, we are baptized with God the Holy Spirit. And we've studied the baptism of God the Holy Spirit in detail. Now, the baptism of God the Holy Spirit is not found in the Old Testament. It was prophesied by Jesus during his earthly ministry in Acts chapter 1, verse 5. And the mechanics of uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit are found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. So, this has to do with the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus 
uh, will come and uh, baptize you. The baptism of God the Holy Spirit. Whose sandals I am not worthy to lace. He will identify with you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. What is this? This, uh, you hear baptism, nobody runs around saying, I've been baptized with fire. Well, that's because if they were, they just went to hell. This has to do with the uh, baptism of fire at the end of the tribulation when all unbelievers will be taken off the earth and only believers will be left. And that has to do with the baptism of fire whose winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clean out his threshing floor and will gather his wheat into the storehouse. What is this? This, remember, Matthew is written to Jews. And remember that right now there is no church age. So this isn't talking about the resurrection of church age believers, the winnowing fork. It's not possible. This, this, uh, the resurrection, all of these things, well, the, the Sadducees believed in resurrection, but it hadn't been revealed as to the church age yet. And the church age doctrines are still hidden. We have to remember that. When Matthew was written, most of the church age doctrines were still hidden. And it was the Apostle Paul, along with the others, who would start to bring out the Musterion doctrines. Before this time, none of that. So uh, Matthew, addressing the Jews, is addressing, well, what occurs at the end of the tribulation. And his wheat into the storehouse will be his wheat the believers going into the millennium. Those who were spared the baptism of fire because they had believed in Christ now go into the storehouse, into the millennium. But the shaft he will burn, according to his Norman standard, is what it means, according to his integrity, because his justice was not satisfied because they did not believe in Christ. So the shaft will be burned with an inextinguishable fire. And that will be at the end of the tribulation when all the unbelievers will be, uh, as it were, winnowed out and cast into the lake of fire. Then in verse uh, 13, we have the baptism of the king. Chapter 3, 13. Then, and that means at that point, Jesus came from Galilee to John to be baptized by him in the Jordan River. But John said no, saying... I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Well, here is the Lord Jesus Christ, John's, uh, John the baptizer's Savior, the one he's been talking about, making a straight path for, and uh, teaching people that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And so uh, this is what occurs when Jesus comes. He has a lot of humility and understands that uh, he is saved by Christ. But then Jesus replied to him, Do it now. In other words, stop arguing. Do it now, for it is right for us to fulfill all righteousness. Now all righteousness is going to be fulfilled at the cross. And so Jesus is saying it is right to have all righteousness fulfilled. All of it will be fulfilled at the cross because the one who is all righteous did all the work. Who is all righteous? Jesus Christ, not us. You see, uh, Jesus Christ is the all righteous because he did the work. Behind this is redemption, where the Savior must be perfect righteousness to pur purchase the spiritual freedom for the human race. So righteousness uh, brought Jesus where sin brings us. Where does sin bring us? To the cross. Where did righteousness uh, take Jesus? To the cross. So you see the analogy here. We go to the cross for our righteousness. Jesus was righteousness, was righteousness, all righteousness. So he had to go to the cross. It was the only means of our salvation. If it could be done another way, uh, for example, when Jesus prayed, if it be your will, take this cup from me. In other words, if it be your will, find another way for these people to be saved. But it wasn't. This was the only way. And that is because of all righteousness that our Lord uh, had. So uh, no one can really uh, follow the Lord into this baptism. What baptism? The baptism, the identification with our sins. And uh, at one point, Jesus uh, tells those with him uh, who are anxiously wondering if they will sit at his right hand, uh, they say to him, uh, 
uh, uh, something to the nature of, will I be at your right hand? And then he says, well, if you are able to drink from the cup that I drink, what is that? He, he was about to take on the, all the sins of the world. But they didn't understand what he was saying, so they said, oh, yes, Lord, we can drink from that cup. And no, they couldn't. And it shows their ignorance. So he, the cup that he is going to drink is the identification with our sins. So the ritual baptism of, G, of Jesus Christ was unique in that he declared his positive volition. In other words, he's declaring, I'm going to the cross. That's why he was baptized, because he's saying, I'm going to the cross to be identified with all of your sins. And this is why he's going through this ritual. And it was ritual with reality, because he knew what it meant when he was being baptized. He knew that this would be him going to the cross and dying spiritually as a substitute for us. So he went into the water to identify himself with the burial of our sins. Our sins have been buried on the cross. So that is when he was dipped into the water and came out of the water to indicate his resurrection, that he would rise again. So he goes in the water, identification with our sins, up out of the water, identification with the resurrection. All of this was a point of doctrine that he was teaching that he would be the one who would take on the sins of the world. So his baptism was unique in that it was a ritual that represented something dealing with himself. So he would rise again and be in the presence of the Father as a, as a member of the human race on our behalf. Therefore, we do not follow the Lord into baptism. And that's a heresy. We can't follow the Lord into baptism, and a lot of uh, churches have started to say that or have said it all along, to follow Jesus in baptism. You can't. He was, his baptism was identification with our sins. So pastors who think that are thinking just like the people who said, I can drink from the same cup, and you can't. And they don't even know what it means. It means the imputation of all the sins of all of human history. So after Jesus said this, and John had learned a point of doctrine from our Lord, then John yielded to him. And after Jesus was baptized, and I just indicated what that was all about, just as he was coming up out of the water, the heavens suddenly opened, and he saw the Spirit of God. This is the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit, which is prophesied in Isaiah, chapter 11, verses 2 through 3, along with other passages in Isaiah. This represents the sustaining ministry of the Holy Spirit that was given to our Lord without measure, found in John 3, 33, and sustained the humanity of Christ on the cross for at least three hours. This is the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit. The dove is an indication of of uh, God the Holy Spirit uh, coming on him and it, although he was born with it it was a, a type of the ritual so that everyone could see it everyone could see uh, what was occurring and a voice from heaven said the one keeps on being the one that is Jesus Christ this one keeps on being my own beloved son in whom I take great delight and a God the Father could take great delight in God the Son because he was sinless. And that is why the dove came down and made that very clear to everyone. Now in chapter 4, uh, we will uh, go there tomorrow, chapter 4. And you might remember chapter 4 from uh, the uh, special, the Easter special. And this is where we have the doctrine of kenosis, and we'll go over it again. And this is uh, very significant. And it's very significant for us spiritually as well. Because we too have the same protocol. He had the prototype. We've been given the protocol. So we see how Jesus li is living. We're seeing the first part now. We're seeing when he was baptized, showing that he's going to the cross. And we, we are going to see tomorrow how he will be tested and how he handles these tests under the filling of God the Holy Spirit. The same filling of God the Holy Spirit that you have. And we will see how he endured some tremendous testing, and yet he even endured more when he went to the cross. 
And this is actually beginning with chapter 4. This is the beginning of our Lord's evidence testing. And then on the cross, of course, it goes way beyond evidence testing. And we, we note from this, the prototype spiritual life worked for our Lord, and the protocol spiritual life will work for us. And if any of you are ever guilty of saying doctrine doesn't work, it's not that doctrine doesn't work, you just haven't learned these things of Scripture in order to apply them in your life. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. Uh, may these things of Scripture edify us, and may we come to learn more and more, uh, your knowledge, to grow more and more in, in grace and in knowledge. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.